Um, and from that, uh, I'll entertain a motion regarding a readmit. Okay, I move to uh, accept staff's recommendation to readmit student case number 09-10-11. Senior Ball, Red Ribbon, Red Ribbon Week, um, Santa Paula Week, and Renaissance. Um, so we're busy. Yeah. And you're doing well. You told me on your finals, right, Sammy? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. I'm here. Does anyone have questions, Sammy? Senior Ball is that the one? Is it like Renaissance? Um. Yeah, for seniors, mm -hmm. and it's masquerade theme. Oh. Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, superintendent's report. Okay. Uh, we'll start with Mike. Uh, not a whole lot to report. <coughs> the state is still struggling. Um, the politics are starting to come in play. After all, it is election year. So um, whether or not they pull the trigger is going to be more politics than just math. So um, we're we'll stay tuned. Um, the state budget facility wise uh, next week we have some of the major maintenance projects we've been putting off for example um, changing out the air conditioning at the middle school because it or this building because it uses a crane and we need to have the, the buildings vacant when we're lifting and no no children around plus some of the work we're going to be doing at the high school in the science building which is very invasive so um, that just some major maintenance next week. Rio Vista, if you have a chance to go by, we're pouring the sidewalks around the school. We're getting ready, um, the parking lot's in. Um, we're putting up the plywood around two of the buildings and um, putting up some more iron. So it, it's starting to take shape. Let me talk about the budget. What I'm carrying out of Sacramento is that it's an election year coming up. And because of that, there may be some maneuvering to try to postpone the trigger uh, that will cause a, a drastic uh, decrease in revenue. We're not sure if that's going to happen, but uh, you know, politicians, it's an election year, 
So uh, they care more about it. They, their seat than they do about what they're supposed to do to the rest as citizens. But in any event, uh, we'll prepare. Mike's done a very good job of making sure that we're going to be prepared. We have to have money in the bank. So if it does happen, even if it does happen, the following year, if they postpone it, it will be doubly difficult. So even though you think you have a little easing, easing off, it will be twice as difficult when they do pull the trigger because the economy is not stock market is down how much today it, it went up 135 at the end it's all on a kicker but it was down 260 yesterday um, but the, there's not the jobs without jobs and people buying things our <coughs> state tax system doesn't work so. Thomas bought a lot of stock negotiations we actually met with CSCA today and I'm happy to say we have a tentative agreement uh, that was signed now uh, for last year's openers, and so that'll go to the Burbank office for approval and then back to members. And so we're hoping that gets approved so we can um, wrap that up and then get into this year's openers. Uh, we also had a side letter that we came to agreement on, so uh, it was a productive day. So, so Michael has a, a big one a report today so Michael anything else uh, yes I'd like to add three items in addition to that report uh, there's a term that has surfaced three years ago uh, nationally and it's now beginning to trickle down to California since the state school board approved it last June I believe it is the core common core state standards I repeat common core state standards CCSS and uh, uh, what has happened nationally is that they have worked, they meaning all the states have worked together under the direction of the federal government to unify all of the standards. Because right now we've got 50 states that have 50 standards in math and language arts. So what they have done over the past three years is to unify all the parts the states took the best out of the standard from each state with the goal of having a standard that would prepare all students for college and career. That was their goal. So they match it to what's needed out of the workforce, they match it to what's needed to be a successful college student, and then they created this common core state standards. The board, the State Board of California, voted those common core standards to be included in California's assessment system. So later on, in the next two months, I will be preparing a package, a presentation to the board to give an update on that. Uh, I'd like to make sure that our leadership here is aware of it, that they have a working knowledge of it, and then also give you a roadmap as to how we can prepare ourselves for the test that's going to be given to third, eighth, and eleventh grade students starting 2014 to 2015. That's when we're going to implement the test to measure the, the success our students have in the common, common core state standards. You know why they put that in effect? Because some states have very low expectations, very low Texas. standards, and then we have higher ones. We're being prepared uh, nationally with other ones who graduation rates even. You know, if your standards are low and you have to pass in case you have to pass in another state, it's not real fair. So they're trying to get something that's equitable across all 50 states. It says everybody has to come, and that's just the way it should be, that we're all going to be starting at the same starting line. You know, this is where we start. Now let's find out just how well you're doing at the end of the race, as opposed to you start here, but if you're in Texas or Alabama, so you start over here, so you don't have to run 100 yards, you don't have to run 80. And then we're supposed to be at the same end at the same time. So I think they're trying to standardize it to make sure that everybody has a, it's a fair game for everybody. So I'll be giving a presentation to the board on that in the next two months. Uh, secondly, I spoke too soon, I mentioned last, time I gave a report that we formed eight task forces, we have to add one more. Mm -hmm. And that's ELD, English Language Development. A quarter of our students are ELD. 
And that's an area that I, I was hoping we had to wait, but we could not wait. That's an area that needs attention, so we now have nine task forces that we're managing out of that services. And then lastly, uh, we're planning a staff development October 17. The details are not there yet. I know it's a short notice. Uh, it's in the area of math, not a program, but a strategy. Uh, teachers can use in the classroom teaching math. So hopefully the next two days we can wrap up the details and uh, announce it if it works out. Uh, so that's where we are. Okay. You know, I have an opportunity to go to uh, Iru and the uh, town council meeting. Deanna is working, Diana's working on her uh, school plan right now. So I'll do, is it tomorrow to do? When am I doing school plans to range and meet? Okay. I'm sorry. Is your is your school plan due to Michael? Yes, I turned it in today. Yes. Today, so tomorrow, tomorrow yes. day. <clears throat> She's doing the final documents or the final touch-ups over there. And I went to town council, and it was it was an interesting uh, event. It was very well attended. Uh, it was packed pretty much. And uh, Captain, she kept her. She's chief. McGrath was there, and a bunch of other people are talking about the services out there. And, and I'll probably end up. I was invited to attend every single meeting, so that's a challenge. But they have to meet. So, but it was it was a very good meeting. I think uh, we'll do a lot more of that kind of stuff. Okay, we're done. Right? Anybody else? Anything else? Michael, anything else? Mike, Don. Okay. <coughs> Would you like to introduce any task 
task force members who are here. I have one task force member here, Mary Ellen Garcia, and I did promise them if they did attend, they would not be required to give, come up and give an impromptu presentation, <laughs> but they um, were not excused from answering questions. So if Mary Ellen, you are it. Okay. <laughs> I'm in. Go ahead. And she's a great representative of the committee too. So um, welcome Mary Ellen and thank you. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chrissy Shefferly. I'm the principal at Mount Vista Elementary School. And I have the um, opportunity this year to chair the Essential Standards Pacing Guide Task Force Committee. Um, the committee is made up of 24 teachers, um, one teacher per grade level from every single school. And what we did when we originally um, developed the committee, we didn't have representation from every school. We just had um, a limited number. I think we had 16 um, from each uh, total. But we decided that this um, pacing guide task force was so important and we wanted the buy-in and the representation from every single school that we decided to expand it. So grades K through six, a representative from each elementary school for each grade level. So 24 teachers. And um, best decision, because we're developing pacing guides as a district. The um, purpose of the task force committee is to develop district-wide systems. And, and we've been hearing that um, over and over again this year. And the beauty of being a unified school district is we have the opportunity to work together and create systems. And um, it's been a challenge um, for us as principals too. Um, we meet prior to every a big committee meeting to make sure that we're all on the same page so that Jan and Scott and Diana know the direction I'm going in and that they have the input as well um, for the whole administrative team to be able to guide our district. And one of the goals of that is so any teacher that comes to every single one of us, we're all on the same page and we're able to answer questions. So um, we meet and collaborate. Uh, the second purpose of the task force is to establish a fidelity of our core curriculum, and that's open court. Um, not saying that open court is the perfect curriculum. Um, I don't know if there is a perfect curriculum out there or a perfect assessment, but it's something that we've adopted, a curriculum that we've adopted as a district, and it creates that fidelity. What we want to make sure is that it doesn't matter what elementary school your child goes to whether they go to Mount Vista, Sespe, San Cayetano, or Piru, they're all receiving a viable, guaranteed curriculum. That means what's been taught in every grade level is the same. And the state standards has, have, has given us that direction. So that is the big purpose, is to make sure that there, there's fidelity in the curriculum. So that way, as we teach, as we give assessments, we're able to analyze our data. We're able to compare apples and apples. When we're all going off in dis different directions, it's hard to identify best practices. So second reason, one, develop, develop district-wide systems. Two, is establish that fidelity to our district adopted curriculum. And again, like I mentioned, um, the objective is our, of our committee is to develop pacing guides for every single open court unit that will take us through the beginning to the end of the school year, kindergarten through fifth grade, with the input from every single elementary school. What does this look like and what resources will we use? What we started off with is um, I asked every single teacher to bring their own pacing guides. We wanted to make sure that we brought in the expertise of all the teachers represent, representative of all the schools. They brought any work they had done on pacing guides and we were able to look at those. The next thing I provided to them were our Fillmore Unified School District Essential Standards. And I'm gonna use second grade as a point of reference. What we have done district-wide over the past two years, Mariela? Two years, is identify essential standards. <clears throat> Basically what we've done is we've taken all of the standards, California state standards for every grade level, and we've identified power standards. What we know is that 
the, by the research of Doug Reeves, um, he's one of our gurus in education, he states that um, there is no way every single student can master every single standard. What we need to do is create a K through 22 educational system. That's his rationale for identifying power standards. Identify the standards one, that are on um, our state tests. Two, identify standards that students need to progress to the next grade level. Three, identify standards that are high endurance, building blocks that, uh, that kids need. So this is the work we've done over the past two years. Every single grade level has essential standards by trimester. Basically, what you see on here are the standards that we expect every single student to master, not just be exposed to, but to master. So we needed a uh, accountability system for this. If we're gonna expect students to master this, we need to create pacing guides to make sure that what's taught in every single grade level and in every single classroom is the same. Teachers may say, um, you're taking the autonomy away, you're, you're taking the, the freedom away. But the, the way I've explained it to the teachers is that um, we need to think of education and teaching as an art and a science. The science has been given to us, the California state standards. We know what we have to teach. And that is what we're doing here. We're prioritizing what needs to be taught. The art is the magic of the individual teacher in the classroom, the best practices, the teaching strategies. That is what we need our teachers for. Developing district-wide systems will create a system to be able to identify those classrooms, those schools, those grade levels that are achieving. But unless we compare apples to apples, there's not a way to measure that. So again, they brought their own pacing guides. That's for the validation, the buy-in, that we're acknowledging the work that they've done over the years. Two, we've given them the um, essential standards. What we also did was I gave them pacing guides from Desert Sands District. Be here. Um, there's been many schools that have done a lot of work on pacing guides, but again, it's not the same if we just hand teachers someone else's pacing guide. We don't have the buy-in. We don't have the work that went behind digging into the standards. So they were able to bring their pacing guides, essential standards, Desert Sands pacing guides, the essential standards from our district. We also um, have moved towards common assessments. Prior to this pacing committee, we were all over the page in the district as far as how we were assessing kids at, at every unit. Schools made their own. They used an assessment we created. They used an a textbook assessment. And they used, some schools used the Reading Lions. As principals, we got together. We looked at all the different types of assessment. This um, assessment has been used um, successfully in high-performing districts. This uh, assessment has been um, looked at in comparison to the CST, and there's districts that have found a relationship between a percent proficient on this and proficient on the CST. It's difficult, very difficult. Um, what, what we've noticed when we switched over to this um, assessment, we saw scores drop about 10%. It's difficult, but what it is, it's aligned to the CST. So we want to make sure that we keep the expectations high and the rigor high. So these have been purchased for every single school. Again, a development of a district-wide system. Common pacing guide, common essential standards, common assessment. Based on these, we can analyze data, identify successful practices, and replicate those practices within the district. So they were able to look at these. And we have them for every single grade level. So they use their pacing guides, desert <coughs> essential standards, desert sands, and these. So they had many points of references to develop these pacing guides. 
And they were also able to look at our Fillmore Unified School District trimester assessments. These are the assessments that were developed last school year, and I think uh, Scott is heading up this committee. These assessments were developed based on the essential standards. <coughs> Basically, you saw the standards. How are we going to measure whether or not students mastered them? Right here. This is the summative. So they looked at summative. They looked at our reading lines. They looked at pacing guides. They looked at essential standards. And from there, they started creating pacing guides. What we did is uh, we all met, and I presented the, the committee with the overview. And then we broke off, and every single grade level created a plan on how they were going to tackle this. Um, some grade levels have elected to um, utilize half-day subs in the afternoon because they didn't want instruction to be taken away from core. Um, I know fifth grade met today and uh, finished all of your pacing guides. Um, kindergarten meets every Friday after school as a committee. Teachers are meeting by email and other teachers are use, using the sub out days. Third grade's just meeting after school. So different grade levels, depending on what has worked for the, the grade level teachers, have been getting together on their own time developing these pacing guides. And, um, what I've heard is, uh, and this is comments from three different schools, um, from fifth grade today, what one of the teachers stated, it finally makes sense. We've been putting the cart before the horse. Finally, the essential standards make sense. We're connecting the pieces for teachers. The individual work that has been done in the past, we're connecting them and making them meaningful. And I, was, I had the, the privilege of being in the room while they were working and to hear teachers dig into the standards and say, no, 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 we need to teach this more. This is a hole in the curriculum. Let's plug it in here. No, what does this standard mean to you? Is this being assessed? No, we're assessing this on the trimester assessment. We need to make sure we're teaching it. So it's exciting to hear teachers from four different schools collaborate on what is being taught. <coughs> And again, that they're bringing teachers' additions. And, and what's really important in this is that we get the feedback from all of the grade levels. What we're doing is we're developing pacing guides, putting them into place. They submit them to myself and Diana Vitas, <coughs> the principal from Piru. We review them. We make sure that every pacing guide contains the essential components. And then we email the teachers back, either this is a draft, make the necessary changes, or this is final and ready to go. They take that back to their grade level during collaboration. The pacing guides are implemented. And along the way, we need the feedback. And, and I've explained to them, you're asking your grade level teams along the way, is this pacing guide working? Are we hitting the areas that we need to teach? After we give the assessment, how did the kids do? So that's the feedback that we want from the committee to the grade level teachers back to the committee. And we know at the end of the, the school year, we're going to have to go back and make some revisions. But we've set the standard to that all revisions come through the committee. Because if we don't do that, then we're going to have revisions at each and every site and we'll have school pacing guides versus the district. So we've set those um, parameters. Am I doing okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and the way I, I framed it for teachers um, was using a, a football analogy. And uh, it makes sense to me, and, and since we're in football, I'll use the football analogy. Basically what we have, is this is a pacing guide. This is our playbook. It's our rules, our plays, how we're going to attack the game. It's identifying the standards. It's a telling me when they're going to be taught, what assessments they're going to be on. It's telling me for 
Mushroom in the rain. I'm not teaching mushroom in the rain. I'm teaching capitalization and proper nouns. I'm teaching base word families. I'm teaching drawing conclusions, and I'm teaching capitalization. From that one story, those are the skills they have to hit. The days of just teaching mushroom in the rain are gone. It's being specific on what's being taught in that story, week by week, with an um, assessment and review week. All along, every single unit from the beginning to the end of the year, kindergarten through fifth grade. Amazing work. Again, this is our playbook. This is our direction. These are our rules. And in football, we have um, practices. And we know in football, from your practice, what do you do? You refine, right? You have to go over a play again, right? Practice a play. These are our practices. We call these formative assessments. We give these every six to eight weeks. From these assessments, we have to react and respond to them. This is not the final game. These are the practices. So we give these, we assess, we figure out what strand the student scored strong in, what strand the student scored weak in. Could they capitalize? Could they draw conclusions? If not, what do we have to do? We have to practice that play. That's what those tests do for us. A very different concept than tests that the way we, we gave tests when we were in school. You gave them, you put this, the grade in the book, and you moved on. We're now using these as formative assessments. In our world, we have three games before the Super Bowl. And the Super Bowl is our CST. But in our world, we play two games, we go to the Super Bowl, and then we play one more. Makes no sense. So our two big games that we play in our season are the trimester assessments. These are our summatives. We give these at the end of the trimester. So again, we're given our practices, practices. We finally have a game. What was the score? How did kids do? We give a couple of these, and then we play our Super Bowl, the CST, at the end. That is the accountability system that you'll see in Fillmore Unified School District now. And again, Fillmore Unified School District. Not Mountain Vista, not Sespe, not San Cayetano, and not Piru. You'll see it as a district-wide system, which is very exciting. Because we have the capability to move student achievement to levels that we have not seen before. Because I truly believe I've been on distinguished school validation committees, I've been on curriculum audits, and when I go in and I look at the teaching, I look at the caliber, we have it. We have it. But we're not plain unified. We have islands of excellence out there, teachers who are doing a phenomenal job, but we're not working together, and we're not capitalizing on the best practices in the district. It's because we're all playing in different leagues. Now we're going to be playing for Fillmore Unified, with common district systems, common pacing guides, common assessments, common trimesterly assessments. And, and that's something that we have never done in this district. Challenging, very challenging, but something that has not been done in our small district. Any questions on that? That is, yes, John. There's um, a question on the strategy. <coughs> Given that the CSP is occurred before the end of the year, does the pacing guide, is the pacing guide set up to hit all of the state standards before the CST? Or, I mean, how do you, how do you address that issue of the discrepancy between, you know, you've got some days between the CST and the end of the year. Do you squeeze all of it in before the CST, or do you stretch it out and then hope for the best on the CST? Well, unit six, and we have that puppy. You want to answer? Sure. Uh, we came, actually, that was a situation we had today. We went ahead and cal calendared out to unit six, which in the past, out of the four or fifth grade teachers that had met, um, no one has completed unit six, ever, ever. ever. We've each, I think two of us out of four had completed one story for unit six. And unit six out of open court is a review unit. 
every single story, every single thing is, is meant to spiral as a review for the CST. So at this point, we would be finished the second week in May with Unit 6, and I'm not sure when the window is, so we probably, my guess, will be within that review unit, but what we decided to do was to go ahead and teach as if we were always teaching, and then do what we've been doing, which is um, take <coughs> language arts and do a review section, so kind of divide language arts into half into a regular teaching day, and to do a review at the same time, kind of parallel, where in the past we completely dropped open court and just reviewed. So this has given us an opportunity to continue to teach and review at the same time. Yeah. So hopefully we'll actually get a double review. So looking back, we're hoping that we can actually complete Unit 6 before the CSTs because we started late. Okay, so Unit 6 is the final unit? Yes, yes. Okay, for, so for fifth grade. So again, the objective is to finish the entire thing before the CSTs? Or within the, I would say probably a week or two. I, you know, be really close. We, we will be in the middle of Unit 6 during that CST time frame. The power of the essential standards is, regardless of the unit, we have the standards that need to be taught. So again, as we near the end of the school year and get towards those final units before the CST, we can look at our pacing guides and make sure that we've integrated these standards in. So that's one of the things that, yes, we'll have to look at as the pacing guides are being developed. Yes. Um, this plan and the system that you're creating is great. My, my concern would be the teaching strategies. Absolutely that are related to the standard. And I know we have individual teachers. Mm -hmm. My hope is that when they collaborate, they're sharing the best practices, the best teaching strategies in the classroom, and that the teachers are adopting them and not being threatened by this quote unquote teacher freedom to do as you please when you close the door, I'm gonna do my own thing in the classroom. And that's Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So how do we assess that? That is part? the perfect segue, Tony. <coughs> um, the big picture. Exactly what Tony has said. How do we identify best practices? We have we need the data. The data will tell us what the best practices are because we could feel, feel, feel all we want. But unless we have the data to back up our teaching strategies there's no validity in that. So the big picture here is, this is what this system will enable us to do. Exactly what Tony is saying. Again, like I mentioned earlier, when we were in school, even when, when we taught, we have a grade, an overall grade, right? Uh, Johnny scored a 76 on the report. It goes in the grade book, you're done. What are data disaggregation system allows us to do is be more specific, to do exactly what Tony said. This is one report that will be available once we have all this stuff in our system. This allows you to get student scores, student names. Remember we looked at that pacing guide and we saw <coughs> conventions, we saw reading comprehension, we saw drawing conclusions. This breaks it out for you. How are we gonna identify the, the successful strategies, we're going to look at these sub-skill areas. And we're going to identify the teachers who have the highest percentages in writing strategies and say, Mrs. Rangel, what are you doing? We've noticed that all of us averaged a 35% on writing strategies. You have an 80%. What are you doing? She shares, well, I did this. I'm using this. I did this activity. That's the best practices that that you're talking about. But what we want to make sure is the best practices are connected to data. So this is one report that will be available for our teachers with this system in place. This could be done for the grade level. This could be done for the teacher. This could be done for the district. So again, you're identifying successful areas. Another thing we can do to share successful practices and analyze data. This is a report that is available. It's an item analysis. What it is, it has the number question of the assessment. 
the number of students that got that question correct, the number of students that were not proficient, the number of students that were proficient, and the blue is no answer. So when I look at this, question seven, only 19, 22% of the students got this question correct, 76% got it wrong. What was that question? Is it inferential comprehension? Is it factual comprehension? And if it's inferential comprehension, what do we need to do to teach these kids? It allows us to break the exams down this specific. And again, and identify <coughs> schools, teachers, grade levels that are having success with this. All by using the same assessment. When we're all on the different page, you can't do this. Because you have nothing as a basis of comparison. So again, this is the big picture. This is the goal, to be able to identify best practices, to identify teachers, grade levels that are being successful. Another report. Again, Once we have these common systems in place, here's the number of each question. Again, there's your standards. This is the um, percent correct for every question. This is nice. Question one, the correct response is in the black box. 23% of the students <coughs> answered the correct response. A, but 56% of them answered number C. It highlights the most common incorrect response. So again, item analysis. Why in the world are these kids selecting C? What is tripping them up? What is making them answer C instead of A? When it's connected to standards, you can go back and reteach. Within your target time, your intervention time, you can go back and be very specific and intentional on what the kids know and what they don't know. But in order to do any of this, we have to have the district systems. Because if we're all teaching different things, all of us are deciding what standard is most important, there's not a basis of comparison. This is a report I found um, today. It's a great report. And I think we're scratching the surface with data-wise. This is a report, again, be more specific. We know that in our district, the, um, the uh, subgroup that we're struggling on in is EL. Also, SCD, Students on Free and Reduced Lunch. This report here, let me blow it up a little bit for you. This takes all your students here. You can see 38% of them scored proficient on this test, 26% of them, 26% for English learners, 33% for students on free and reduced lunch, if they're sorry, 36%, 62% of our white students, 34% of our Hispanic students. This breaks it down by subgroup. So we can identify, are we hitting all of our students? We know that we're struggling in EL. 26% of them scored proficient overall. On the spelling, only 17% of them did. On reading comprehension, 12. Look at conventions, 52%. Where do we need to, to um, reteach for English learners? Reading comprehension. Where does ELD, what, we, what do we need to focus in on? Vocabulary development. What do we need to focus in on target? Reading comprehension. So we could disaggregate by subgroup so we're not leaving any subgroup behind. So it allows us again to be specific. And again, I just wanted to show you a variety of reports that um, we're going to be able to do. This one I like. Um, the colors are a little hard to see here. Basically, after you give an assessment, classroom A, it tells you the percentage of students that scored proficient, 
basic, far below, ba below basic, and far below basic. You can compare the classroom to the grade level to the district to be able to see how this teacher did in comparison to his or her overall grade level. Now compared to all of the second grade in the district. How are we scoring at a school? How are we scoring at a classroom? That's how you identify those best practices, by having the data. So again, this isn't possible unless we have district-wide systems, unless we have the essential standards, unless we develop the pacing guides. Without the pacing guides, we're all at liberty to teach what we want. Excuse me? When you want. When you want, absolutely. You can spend a whole quarter on drawing conclusions but miss inference main idea in sequence. So this creates a common focus for each grade level based on the essential standards, your power standards. We looked at blueprints. We identified the questions on the CST, the standards that you're most vague for your buck. We looked at standards that had 14 questions on the CST versus standards that only had two. And that's how the essential standards were created. What we're finding is that there were some holes. Because it's interesting, not until now are these pieces coming together. They're meaning something. And that's the discussion that we have going on kindergarten through fifth grade in our district right now. A lot of work. Um, I've, I've heard comments uh, from the kindergarten team. It's nice to be able to work together in a common area. We haven't done this for a long time. Um, meaningful. The work is getting done, which is exciting. Um, I also had a first grade teacher from your school, Jan, email me and, and say, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, I, I hate to, to bring this on right now, but when can we do math? We're ready for math. But holy cow, gosh. <laughs> you know? um, and Mary Ellen said the same thing. She said, we're ready for math. The goal is all pacing guides completed by December for every single unit K-5. And then Michael will bring them to the school board and um, we'll get those approved. And then uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to stop them. I think we're going to have to do math. Second, second semester, but they're asking for it because they want that, that common focus. So that is an overview of the pacing guide committee. It leads right into Scott's committee. They're looking at the standards, the essential standards. They're looking at the open court assessments. They're looking at the trimester assessments and make sure the alignment is right. Jan has the other piece. Once we have the alignment, when we have, once we have the common focus, we need to communicate it to parents. Now you have a report card. So that's how these interface. And then Michael brought on the um, curriculum committee who are identifying the um, essential teaching strategies within in the district. You walk into every classroom, these strategies are there. John's doing writing. Um, Every principal has a different area, but when you take a step back, it's all part of the big picture to develop these systems, which if we do it right, are all going to support each other. So it's exciting. We're working hard, but like I said, I don't think we've ever done this. It, it's very interesting um, for me to take a step back um, and see district systems coming into play because we can't act alone. As much as I want to go off in one direction and Jan wants to go off, Scott has ideas, we all call each other, okay, we need to meet. And we get together, and we make sure we're on the same page, we make sure that we're going in the same direction, and then the message gets communicated out to every single teacher. Common, common information, agreed upon information. So it's, it's exciting. Chrissy, you mentioned the teaching Is that part of the pacing? Guide? Yes. Every, um, that, yes. <coughs> Every grade level has, some, has common elements. They have dates, lessons, story, essential standards, and then their skills. And they have to identify one week as review and assessment. Kindergarten, I have all of them here. 
show you fifth grades because it's right here. Same thing, you have your date, you have your standard, you have your selection, your skills. <coughs> seven, that week, reteach, district writing test, assessment. So part of the, the um, pacing guys, they had to put in a week of reteach. What um, first grade <coughs> did was they said, it's hard for us to wait eight weeks to reteach. They incorporated every Friday as a reteach day. Because they said the kids are the kids are too young to be able to wait six weeks to reteach. So you see here by day, 10-3, 10-4, 10-5, 10-6, 10-7, assess, reteach. With the littler ones, we have to do it more frequently. And, and that's the, the flexibility that they have within the pacing guide. You create it to meet the needs of the students in the grade level, but there has to be some common elements. The date, the lesson title, the essential standards. You have to identify them by asterisks. One asterisk means it's going to be identified on the unit assessment. Two asterisks mean it's going to be identified on the trimester assessment. You have to have um, the essential concepts, what grammar skills, what vocabulary skills, what spelling skills, what reading comp skills you're going to have. And what some grade levels are starting to do, I know fifth grade, is identify gaps in the open court curriculum. You guys found that it didn't assess. Um, it Can didn't you give me an example? Yes. We, um, the standard is for fifth grade is homographs, but all of the material that we have in open court is for homophones, which is actually a fourth grade standard. So by teaching what the curriculum has and not looking at our essential standard, we have been missing the mark unless you supplemented somewhere. So it was a standard, but it was a fourth grade standard. So and <coughs> if you weren't real careful, you could, you know, miss a whole chunk of teaching. And, and and I'm glad she pointed out that because what it's doing is we're not just teaching open court from page one to page 250. Everything we do is intentional. <clears throat> we know exactly why we're teaching the stories. Exactly why. And when you start looking at the essential standards, you see holes. That, that's the, the, the power in getting together and looking at these. But again, we can't throw open court off the boat because we don't have a common curriculum to base, to base this on. But we can identify the standards that are going to be hit in each story. So it, it's been great. It's been a, yes. I, I just wanted to add one thing as a value piece on the teacher perspective. Um, for example, in the last four weeks, fifth grade has received, and I'm counting off of just memory, so I might be off on my numbers, but about 10 new students in the last four weeks. And out of those 10 new students, we've had three that were inter-district inter transfers coming from other elementaries. And what we have found is we always know, getting from different districts, we're going to not know exactly what you've covered and where you were. But what we didn't realize is getting those three students, we were all on completely different pages. So it was really eye-opening as a fifth grade to know that these three students who came from three schools in our community, every single one of them was on a different page. So that shouldn't be. So that is the value. When we talk today, those three students shouldn't have to be retaught. They shouldn't have to have a gap in their education when they're right here across the street. And then the other value piece that we discussed today was the fact that now that this is done and we, um, fifth grade is finished and we created all the pacing guides, there will now be a revision, obviously a work in progress to kind of fine tune. But now when we meet again, we can talk about best practices. Mm -hmm. We've already started to develop strategies and ideas of how this, how do you do this? How do you do this? Now you bring that and I'll bring this and we're going to share and we're creating a resource binder that will look the same at every single site. So fifth grade will have a binder of every possibility of, a, of an option that we've all agreed upon. So now the, the toolbox is there and if say I choose to do appendix you know, A and you do B but we all agree that they're doing the same thing that's your choice, but we are all agreed upon what is going into the pacing guide and what's going into the binder. So our resource toolbox is complete. And, and what's exciting as, as a, an administrator is you have teachers saying, can we do math next? Can we develop a resource finder so we can all have the same things to supplement and reteach? That's exciting. 
that you have teachers getting into curriculum, working together to develop these common district-wide systems. So um, we're excited. Um, we're excited at the end of the semester, we'll bring forward every single pacing guide, K through five, and then um, work on math. Next. Anything else? Yeah, well, it's wow. <laughs> you can hear that excitement. It's exciting. It, 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 it's it's very exciting. Exciting even for us. I'm sure hearing that coming from you and everybody working together. It's very thorough. There were a few questions I had jotted down, but as you went through, you're right. You answered them as you went along. So, and, and, it, and bottom line, who wins? The kids. The, students, yeah. the kids. It's all about student achievement. And you know, I love our theme for this year: students first, whatever it takes. And we are doing whatever it takes this year to, to create uh, systems for our district. So it's exciting. But yeah, wow, a lot of work, but um, it's for our kids. One, one observation, I mean, um, I think, you know, Virginia, you've been on the board longer than I have, but as far as, as long as I've been on the board, I don't think we've spent this much time at a board meeting focused on curriculum, and no. I'm very happy to see that. That yes. to me, I, I've, I've often been critical, I've said before that, you know, we can be board members up here and talk about approving this or proving that, and that's not really what, that doesn't really have a huge impact on kids, but stuff like this has an enormous impact on kids, mm -hmm. and I'm really glad to see that we're, we're focusing on this. So, yeah, me too. great. Me too. I just have a couple of comments. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, tell the good work that's going on. No, no, I'm, I was taking notes on things that Chrissy said about data. We talk about data-driven decisions, but that's how you would a coach and they do it all the time. They took a look at the stats. That's why you have scouts. You look at the data, then you make your decisions. And that's what we're trying to produce for our students, to give them the opportunity to be more successful than they've ever been before. The other one she's talking about mastery learning, the teaching we teach, that's all a part of the mastery learning that Tony and I probably went through. When you can't master it, you go back and reteach it so they can remaster it. And we've been in this 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 era where we just let the kids go by without reteaching, without getting mastery. And everything's built on blocks, especially in math. And that's why I'm excited about wanting to get them back because I think that's something that we all can do better. And then we talked about when I was the assistant superintendent of Ed Services back in the day, probably almost 20 years ago, we were talking to the state about having our assessment at the end of June. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have a whole year to really teach the kid. I mean, you know, that would be completely logical. Yes. <laughs> so we, we, that was almost 20 years ago, we yeah. were pushing. And they said they couldn't get the data back. Well, technology now is, yeah. should be there close enough that we can actually teach the last day of school and then get the data back to us so that we can start planning for the next year. And so I'm a firm believer in staff development. I would like to end the last day with our kids and then pay the teachers to come back for two more weeks in the summer time to take a look at data and then plan for the next year. When you close a lesson, you should always review and then plan for the next lesson. And we don't teach it. We don't do that. We close it's over. We should close it, review, close it, and then be planning for the next time. And uh, so I've been working really hard with legislators to, to give us some time to really do things that will impact kids, and we have not done that. And the last one, Tony brought up instructional strategies that Chrissy also brought up. And that's how do you really, the art and the science, how do you merge that together so we give our students greatest opportunity to be good or better. What are we doing? There is absolutely research on what good teaching should look like. <coughs> Set an objective, okay? Show them what you want. You give them guiding practice, you practice with them. Then you give them independent practice, and you check on, that's what homework is. Homework should be independent practice on a skill. So when they come back, teachers can check that homework. Oh, this kid didn't get this. Not just a check mark that he handed it in, but did he really, this is one of Lucy's issues, did he really learn or she really learn it? Mm -hmm. If she didn't or he didn't, what, he should, what should she do? Audience, reteach. 
Absolutely. It's not fair to the student to say, just pass you on, and then you're being assessed, and we say, oh, not my fault. Yes, it is our fault. We should be teaching that child that doesn't get it right. So then you do the, you know, then you do your review, you assess them, you do your review, and you do what they call an advanced organizer. You start talking about what's next. And at recess, I used to tell my teachers to do this. Tell the kids at recess when they go out, when you come back, I want you to know what the main theme of the story we just read is. Okay? So they'd go out there, and guess what they would do? You know, they, what, what do you think they would do? What, do, what would you do? You don't know. They'd get together, so when they came in, they got the extra credit kind of point for having the right answer. And it's time, it's things like that. Time on task, take every opportunity to give a kid the knowledge that he's need to be successful. So little things, so I just stand in front of the lunch line, and we do a multiplication table with the third grade kids. So they come through, what's six plus seven? What's four plus three? Okay, as they go by. You know, it became a challenge for those kids. They would actually want to please the principal by being able to answer correctly. And it's a little thing, it's not a big thing. It's a very little thing that you do to help kids learn. And I think that those are the kinds of things that Michael is charged with, with our teachers, to come up with strategies that maximize the potential for our kids to do better. And, and I'm so happy you're here. I mean, you said some things tonight that were really wonderful. I, I appreciate that. There are things that are coming out now. We know we have great teachers. We know we have great kids. Well, we need the systems to make sure that everybody's merging together and all going in the same direction for our students. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your comments. Michael? Um, Alan, you just don't know how proud I am of what they've accomplished. Oh. I was almost in tears. <laughs> <laughs> it was like music in my ears. They're like, whoa! It was. I'm gonna call my wife tonight and tell her that the work is done. <laughs> <laughs> and you go. Uh, <laughs> I'm coming home. <laughs> you got, you got math. Oh, math. <laughs> Chrissy can handle the math. <laughs> Chrissy. Yes, Thank sir. you so much. Thank and you very much. Express, you know, the superintendents and the board's appreciation for the work that you and the task force really has done. And thank you. <coughs> I was there when you guys were meeting, so appreciate that work. And uh, coming up next will be some of the principals also updating you. All the principals <coughs> asked them to be here so they can see what it is that we're telling the board so they can gel. So they take a look at your knowledge, which you've got, and then when they do their presentation, they can review a little bit about what Chrissy talked about and see how that flows into the next demonstration or, or uh, report that we have. Everything should flow. Everything should be coming and flowing in. So at the end of the day, like Chrissy said, everything makes sense. All of a sudden, the aha comes. And you go, whoa, this all makes sense now. Why are we doing data? Why are we doing essential standards? Why are we doing standard-based report card. Why are we doing all these things? And so as Michael gives the, has the teacher <coughs> and principals give the reports, then the board can see how it all makes sense. In isolation, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. I, and I was accused a lot of times of you just piling stuff on, okay? Just pop, but then at the end of the day, they all said, wow, I don't know what you did. It, it's almost magical the way our principals are working on their stuff. And I really appreciate the hard work, and especially teacher input. Yeah. So important that we have teachers in the front line come out and say, this is what we need. And uh, I'm very proud of what you've done, Christine, what you did. And I'm sure that the principals are good. I know they are. Michael's saying some good things about what's happening out there. And uh, I appreciate that a lot for our kids. I thank you. You're not done. <laughs> not done yet. Not yet. <laughs> it's good to see that the principals are taking the leadership role here. That's so important. I know we as a board have been very concerned about the leadership that's being promoted at each site. Yeah, see if it's happening. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Because part of uh, part of leadership is making sure that you train everybody who's with you. And we're gonna have, you're gonna see a strong focus on staff development, whether it's voluntary 
or not, you're going to see us provide opportunities for our teachers. And I think they're going to go after to, to, to learn things. I think they're, everybody, teachers, you know, they, they really want to know what it is you're supposed to do to be successful. I have not heard a teacher say, I want my kids to fail. I've not heard one teacher say, no, 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 they didn't even know a business that want the, the kids to fail. And so uh, I think it's up to us, our staff, to provide the leadership to give opportunities for our principals and our teachers and our parents to really know what's important. And I mean, you can't leave the parents out. Class by step, and I'll make this last comment. I promise I will be quiet till the next time. Um, how are classified, usually, you know, when I was a kid, I was growing up, and I knew my favorite person was in elementary school. It was my custodian. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because when I went to school, the first person I saw was that custodian. And he was so nice, and he was so pleasant, and he was from a foreign country, could barely speak the language back then, but you know what? He was my favorite person. When a kid goes to class, goes to school, and he's riding the bus, the first adult they see is that bus driver. You know how important it is for the bus driver to smile and say, welcome, come on boy. I mean, because you don't know what happened to that child at home that night. You don't know if they had dinner. You don't know if the father was not upset. You don't know what happened. But if that bus driver makes that kid feel good coming in, it changes his whole day. Same thing when a parent comes into a school and the secretary's there or the clerk and they are pleasant. How you, can I help you? And they're smiling and they're trying to help you. You know how, what that does to that parent? That's all a part of the system, our system, and how do we make it better? It's not just about the nuts and bolts, it's about the affective piece as well. It's, a, it's not just stats and numbers and facts. It's also that other piece that bonds everybody together, that's the affective piece, how you engage. So I talk about it, and, and Cynthia's done it in her, in her meetings with the office managers. That is so crucial. I don't care if you're a new supervisor. I don't care if you're a groundsman. I don't care what it is. Us adults have an obligation to make sure our kids feel good about coming to school. And that's our goal. Not only are they going to learn, but they're going to be good citizens the greatest country in the world, and I've said that over and over, there is no better country than America in the world, bar none. I don't care of all the stuff that you talk about, how bad it is, go somewhere else and see. This is still the best place to go. And I think we should take advantage of that and make sure our kids can become great citizens. And that's the goal that Michael and I have had since we were working together. So I appreciate you listening to me, but if you're classified or whoever you're out there, parents, smile at a kid. Say, good morning, and see how they feel. And at first they'll look at you, what are you doing? Right? And they go like this. <laughs> I'll watch this little kid going across here in the morning. I said this to Cespi. He couldn't have been this tall. I mean, the backpack was bigger than him. <laughs> and he's carrying his backpack, and he's having a good time smiling and laughing with his brother, I think, was walking to school. I mean, what happens between that and 13? What happens between something in there is not connecting good enough for those kids. If that that's the face that I saw walking across, so cute, it was unbelievable. I looked at a camera next time. That guy, he was dragging that backpack. It was so cool. So, uh, so we're going to need everybody's help. Everybody's help to really put Fillmore on the map as a place where you want to live and have kids, and you want them to go to this school in Fillmore. Here's where you want to live. I look down the road and I drive every time I go home that way. Awesome town, right? That's what they call Santa Clarita, right? Which is awesome town, right? So I've been on the radio. Hey, we're going to be better than awesome. We're going to be better than awesome. I'm going to be talking about it. Better than awesome. Okay? Thank you very much for my teaching.
Homecoming game <coughs> with um, Fraser Park. Um, very interesting. Mike was a busy man. We had <laughs> lightning and uh, oh, postponed the game for a while, and we had the downpour, <laughs> but made it all exciting. So <laughs> we won. That's so <coughs> And the W. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I also heard the. Um, I was asked to drive in the homecoming parade, so I, I was uh, fortunate enough to drive my daughter. She was a homecoming uh, junior princess. Um, when you say drive, is that down the street? Yes. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, no, no, no. no. <laughs> it was just down, it was in the parade. But you yes. escorted her, though. Yeah, I, I escorted her half time. But I, I, got, I guess I got baptized before because the, the clouds opened up and uh, as we were walking over to the other side of the field, everything came down. So I, so, well, fortunately, I mean, her, she was fine. No, she was fine. No, I just had to give up my coat. So anyway, they, when they, what's interesting is in the pictures, I think, that are online, you can't tell that I'm sopping wet. But I'm literally dripping wet from uh, head to foot. So, but the, the, everything, the, the rain went away from, for the actual ceremony. They had us walk back, did the introductions, and then uh, the rain went away for that, that period. So that was nice. And then uh, I also uh, attended the uh, cross country meet at the UCSB Lagoon Track, uh, or a cross country invitation. And uh, it, was, it was very well. The, the boys' uh, cross country team uh, came in first, and I think the girls came in second. So it was. Uh, wow. <coughs> Very good, yeah. And our, our cross country team is very, very strong this year and uh, looking and for great things. And Sammy's on it. Sammy's on it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm ready for the smile. I can't look at me. I need to do that smile. It's great. Which just brings up a little thing for me. I, I probably. Um, just, just having heard from, I don't know how many of you know, uh, one of our alumni, Brian Ball. I guess he just he just uh, qualified for the uh, Paralympic trials wow. many times. Ooh. So Ooh. so and I know sometimes he used to run with the. Yeah. Does yes, he still yes, do that? Still with the, he still runs with us. He still runs. When he's in town. Yeah. 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 So that's really exciting. One of our own is really climbing that ladder. Right. I wouldn't doubt it at all. And he he said he was he was something like two minutes behind. Okay, second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. 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 Ok